Erev Tov Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Glad for you to be here with us this evening, friends. And I just, I'm, I'm really heavy on my heart. I know that Israeli News Live, typically we are a news broadcast. We started off, though, of, 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 as a prophetic teaching channel, and we have gone more into dealing with news and how that relates to biblical prophecy. Uh, and at times we just deal with news alone, and we'll continue to deal with news as well. But because as I have been observing what is going on in the background, what's happening to my people in Israel, as well as my people, my Christian brothers and sisters around the world, and the doctrines that are, that are just coming from every direction, I'm getting, beginning to become extremely concerned about what's going on. And I've just come to that conclusion that I have got to step back into the battlefield, so to speak, and address the biblical truths of our scriptures that we have that we hold so dear to our hearts there and straighten out some of these doctrines that are going on. Today we're going to get into who are the two witnesses and oddly enough, who will they fight? That's going to probably throw you for a, a, another loop altogether. We've talked about the return of the Nephilim and friends, I would have never believed for a single moment that there was a scripture that would actually imply that the two witnesses are going to deal with them. Well, there is a scripture for that, and as far-fetched as that may sound to you, I, I just ask you to bear with me as I go into this. I need to really set a sound, firm, doctrinal stage for uh, the two witnesses, who they are, because there's all types of doctrines about this. And, and I'm not here just to throw people under the bus, but friends, you know, when God says He's sending two witnesses, and the scripture calls it two prophets in another place, uh, it's not going to be then uh, the Old and New Testament. It's not going to be uh, the Jew and Gentile or, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Jews and the Goim. It's not going to be this. Uh, it's not going to be, uh, you know, many other different ideas that are out there. I, I won't even go into this. There's so many different views out there. And I appreciate many of them. I know there's a lot of different ideas as far as, well, it's Elijah and Enoch, or it's uh, John is supposed to return. And I would have to say, if anything, the script, the one for John is probably has a little bit more validation when we think of the scriptures that uh, that seemingly have not been fulfilled about John. Uh, so I'm going to go into this uh, tonight and I think it'll really uh, settle a lot of issues. Now before I get started as well, I want to share with you guys something that happened to me when I was 18 years old. It's the first vision I ever had in my life. And yes, I do have visions. I don't speak about them publicly very often. Uh, I've never said by no means everything that has happened. I, I kind of keep that to myself because I want your foundation to be solid in God's Word, not just in people telling you they have visions or dreams or, or whatever the case may be. There's so many visions and dreams that people are happening that, 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 that they claim that they have, and many of these things never happen. On this case here, though, it was, a, it was very troubling, but it's something that I am seeing that is happening in the world today on a frequent basis. Uh, I was 18 years old, and I won't go into the entire vision that I had, but there was one part in the vision where I come up out of the vision, but yet I'm still in a vision. I'm actually in a twofold vision. And as I came out of one vision, still in the other vision, because I went two levels deep into this vision there, I heard a knock at the front door of my house. And I went to the front door of the house, and when I opened the door, standing there, enveloped in an amber burning fire, was, I believe, to be Yeshua. And when I seen him, I fell to my face on the ground and he began to speak to me, but I could not hear him. And so I draw, draw, crawled a little closer to his feet there. And when I said to him, Lord, I can't hear you. Then he spoke as clear as I'm speaking to you. And he said, man hears more often than he listens. And then I came out of that part of the vision as well. And I was just bawling like you wouldn't believe. And, and my face, everything just soaking wet with tears. 
crying out to the Lord and praying and asking Him, what does this mean? Well, he spent, spent years I spent seeking Him, wanting to really understand what He meant by this. And not long ago, He revealed to me exactly what He was implying. And I was on the right path, but I didn't realize where He was going with this all those years ago. But He was letting me know that man hears more often than he listens. And that's exactly what I am realizing day by day. I may say something, but the people, they hear, but they don't listen. And I know that many people have good intentions, they're good people, but they're quick to make comments, but they didn't listen to what I said. And I'm just a man. I'm only your brother. I'm nobody special. But the point is, we have to listen if we really expect to hear what God wants us to hear. And this is what I'm finding over and over and over again. You know, just like the other day, I'm sitting there and I'm speaking about that there would not be a rapture on September 23rd. And of course, many people wrote comments saying, ah, Steve doesn't believe in the rapture. I can't believe it. I never said anything about if I believed in the rapture or didn't believe in the rapture. I just simply said it will not happen on September 23rd. And the reason being is because I was seeing there was so much hype in the Revelation 12 sign. And I'm sure many are going to say, well, it could happen on Yom Kippur. Well, you know, it's up to God what He does when He does it. But I didn't say I didn't believe in a rapture. And neither did I say I did. I do believe that God does have a catching away. And for those that don't believe in a rapture, before you throw me under a bus, I'll do a video more in depth about that in the very near future as we start dealing with some of these sound doctrinal issues that we really need to get into. And friends, let me tell you something. For my, when I say Jewish brothers, understand, I understand also the difference between the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And quite frankly, most of the house of Israel are actually believers in Yeshua, but with a million different doctrines that are out there. Same thing, you got the house of Judah that's living there, most of them in the land of Israel today. And, and, and my black brothers and sisters, please, I've done videos about this before, and I'm going to do another video soon. I love you. I appreciate you. I don't doubt there's many black people that are Jewish as well because God's, His people, the house of Israel, is a multicolored group. We have in married in, into different groups all along. All right? So we, we don't need to just single it out and make it look like a racial thing. There's no greater race among us, any of us, you know, whether you be Jewish or non-Jewish. It's not the white is better than the black or the black is better than the white. We're the children of God. All right, and we're, this is what we're going to, we're going to have to deal with that issue as we, as we come along too, before too long. But what I'm really concerned about, though, is the house of Judah that is in Israel right now. And we know that they are there because God has prophesied that the house of Judah would return to the land. We see this in Zechariah's prophecy that they go home. In fact, they don't even know what tribe they belong to. Zechariah chapter 14 speaks about that they are the family of David, the family of Nathan and their wives, and they mourn a part. Notice it is a morning time too, near Yom Kippur, no doubt, when it speaks of this, when they recognize the one whom they pierced, which is Yeshua. And we'll get into that a little bit later into this film as well. But I just want to keep that in mind that there they must be there in their home because God can't make reconciliation for their iniquity according to Daniel's prophecy unless the house of Judah is in the homeland right now. And it's more too, friends, than just the fact that we're all going to the Middle East, to, the, to this little plot of land called Israel today. That's another big issue that I want to help you guys with. There's so many things I want to help you with that we got to get back into this, get back onto this steady teaching in the Word of God here. Even here on Israeli News Live, we'll play, place this as well on Danun Institute so that we can cover both those areas. And yes, we will continue to do news broadcasts as they are breaking, but we're going to really start locking down here and let's tighten up the belt here and really begin to look at the Word of God and what God says in His Word and not just take every itch in here, not just because someone says, oh, I'm from Israel and I'm a believer in Yeshua. You know, God has, is no respecter of person. All right? No respecter of person. It's what the Word of God says. This is what matters. And this is what we're going to stick with. Let's get right into this right now uh, without wasting any more time. Who are the two witnesses and who will they fight? Uh, and I'm going to get right 
started with the one favorite scripture that everybody uses that says, well, it can't be Moses because he's got to die. You know, that famous scripture, as we read right here in Hebrews chapter 9, what is it, verse 27 specifically, and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Going up to verse 25, nor yet that he should offer himself often, speaking of Yeshua here, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but not now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Friends, you can go and you can look at the entire chapter of chapter 9 in Hebrews there. It's all about Yeshua. It's all about that he comes only one time to put away sin. So when you read verse 27, it is appointed unto men, or uh, uh, anthropos, Mankind, in other words, because Yeshua came as a human being, it was only appointed for him once to die. This is speaking specifically about him. It has nothing to do with Moses, whether or not Moses is supposed to come back and re-die again, or is it the spirit of Moses upon a man? I would tend to lean more towards the idea it is the spirit of Moses on a man and the spirit of Elijah upon a man, because we see, as the scripture says, does not the scripture say that the spirit of, uh, or does, do, do they not say that uh, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elias? Uh, the same with John, when John, Yeshua says, uh, you know, uh, it was that John, they knew then it was John that he spoke of when he spoke about the coming of Elijah. All right. So again, it was always the spirit of, of the Elijah moving down through the ages there. Now we're looking at possibly the same scenario. Could it be them themselves? Sure it could. I mean, right now, everybody runs around thinking the rabbi Shmerson that he is risen from the dead. Uh, you know, okay. No, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't buy that a single bet in the world. All right. So, but nonetheless, the thing is, is this is the way the scripture reads there. And so therefore it doesn't then in this case, it cannot rule out Moses and Elijah uh, instead of it only being that it has to be Elijah and Enoch because they never tasted death, which by the way, those of you that believe in the rapture, and I'm not here to say that that's not so, but that when you believe in a rapture, you're the guys that most of the time say that, well, they got to come back and die. Well, if you're going in a rapture, do you have to come back and die as well? Do you think that after the resurrection or something, God would take you up and then send you back down in another world later to kill you off because you didn't die? We got to think of the logic of this. The argument doesn't seem valid whatsoever. All right, so let's not waste time on that. Let's move right along here. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11, the foundation for the scripture for the two witnesses. Although it's all through the Old Testament, uh, it's in many books that most people never even think of. It's in uh, Isaiah 61, it's in uh, Zechariah chapter 4, uh, we find it in Micah chapter 7 that speaks of the two witnesses. I mean, you can even go as far back even in the story of David and see the type of the two witnesses laying right there. Uh, and I don't have time to go into that particular issue tonight. That's a story all within itself. Revelation chapter 11, though, let's get right to it. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. All right, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, let's look at those first two verses there. You know, there is a temple. A reed, a rod, measure the temple, leave out that outer court. See, it's given unto the Gentiles, right? Well, isn't it interesting that, it, like in the case, one of many articles here, jpost.com, can the third temple be built without destroying the Dome of the Rock? Now, 
New Jewish Interface Initiative hopes to show that Jews' end-of-days vision could be uh, harmoniously accommodate Islam's present architectural hegemony on the Temple Mount. You remember when um, uh, Pastor Paul Begley actually did an interview with Yehuda Glick and he was talking about building the third temple next to the Dome of the Rock and one of the things, I don't know if it's in the interview or not, but I know that uh, Paul has told me about this before, but Yehuda Glick was saying that they would build in between the third temple and the Dome of the Rock a library for all nations. A library for all nations? And yet the scripture says, what? It says right here, but the court which was without the temple leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. The goim are going to tread it down, and they're going to build a library in between them, the court which is without the temple, leave it out, it's given unto the Gentiles. Now that could go a lot further. I've even done videos long years ago where I speak about that court that's without, that they have given the whole Temple Mount over to the Arabs to begin with. And the Vatican is going to get control of the old city. Uh, there's a lot of things we could look at on that. But when I heard about this international library that's going to be built for the, all the nations in between the Temple and the Dome of the Rock so that both Jews, Christians, and Muslims can all come there together, then I knew that we were looking at biblical prophecy right before our eyes. Now, let's go on to verse 3 and 4 again, though. These are two more verses I want to focus on right now. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the, what? Two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth, right? Two, not three. And, of course, that's where we get the idea. People say Old and New Testament or Jew and Gentile, you know. Uh, totally nonsense. And I'm going to tell you like it is. It's totally nonsense. And you're going to see why. All right, Zechariah chapter 4. Let's look right here at Zechariah to get an idea of what's going on here. All right? Because he uses the two olive trees and the two golden lampstands, right? And I answered the second time and said unto him, What are these two olive branches which are beside the two golden spouts that empty the golden oil out of themselves? And, answer, and he answered me and said, this is the angel talking to Zechariah, Knowest thou not that, uh, what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. The two anointed ones? Now we're going beyond just the ability to be Old and New Testament. It's the anointed ones. Like Yeshua was the anointed one, but these are the anointed ones. So they're anointed with His Spirit. They are pulling from the candlestick, right? They're pulling from that lampstand. Their, their, their oil is coming from the lampstand. Remember, what does Yeshua say? He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Right? Now, Think about it, too, in, in the analogy that we see right here, Matthew chapter 17. Remember this beautiful parallel that we see, and we have, even here on the screen here, you have Yeshua here with Moses and Elijah on either side. There's your, there's your, there's the beautiful, the, 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 the root. And what is he called? He's called the root and the offspring of Jesse, the bright and morning star. He is that lamp, that golden lampstand, Right? And then we have Moses and Elijah on either side. Here the scripture is telling you about these two olive trees, and here the two olive trees are standing on, the two olive branches are standing on either side. Watch what he says here. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, and his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, which is Greek for the word Elijah, talking with him. It wasn't Elijah and Enoch. Okay? And, and you'll understand in a minute why I really press this issue here. Okay? Revelation 11. All right, let's go and let's look at verse 5 this time. And if any man will hurt them, Fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. 
and if any man will hurt them he must in this manner be killed well this look then at the nature of the two witnesses and again notice if any man will hurt them you know so keep in mind it's not going to work Jew and Gentile all right fire proceedeth out of their mouth does fire come out of your mouth no I don't think so second Kings chapter 1 who did who was able to, for this to happen with before it was Elijah right then the king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50 and he went to him and behold he sat on the top of the hill and he spoke unto him O man of God the king has said come down and Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50 if I be a man of God let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. So his, remember, the word of God is more powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the word that he spoke was that sword and it was also the fire that issued from his mouth because what he spoke, that happened. It's not going to be that they go around like flamethrowers with their mouth and burn everybody up. No. But if there is a need, and believe me, there may be a very serious need in this day and age. All right? Now, also, Revelation 11, let's take a look at verse 6 here. And we'll read a whole the 6 through 9, but then we're going to focus on verse 6. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over the waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, see, and shall overcome them and kill them. Two guys. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, which is going to be right there in Jerusalem. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Hmm. So let's look at verse 6. I got a lot to say about the Sodom and Egypt. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Another marker to show you who these two witnesses are. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So friends, I appreciate, you know, everybody runs around, you see all these excitement, they get on the internet, all oh, the rivers turn to blood, biblical signs are happening. All right, I understand. It is kind of, it's interesting, it's exciting, but that's not what the Word of God says. These will have that power, okay? And not algae bloom. We're talking about turning the rivers to blood. All right, that's what the Word of God said. That's what they'll do. Now, who had that, who had that power, that gift? Well, let's look at Exodus chapter 7, all right? And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thy hand over the waters of Egypt, over, over their rivers, and over their streams, and over their pools, and over their ponds of water, that they may become blood. So Moses was the one that could do that. His rod. Now, of course, Aaron actually did the physical work with the rod, but it's Moses' rod. And Moses speaks the word. Again, like the fire from the mouth, it's the word spoken, and then it's actually acted out. And I think Moses and Aaron both are a type of your two witnesses. But in this case, it's Moses and Elijah. Because nowhere do we ever see where Aaron ever calls fire down to destroy his enemies like Elijah does. But we find in 1 Kings chapter 17, though, because here comes the issue about the rain. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not, not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now in the Hebrew language here, im ihaye. Let me see if I can find here. We go. Im ihaye hashanim haele tal u matar. By the way, matar is a word for rain. Geshem is what most people think. If you if you're studying modern Hebrew, we use the word geshem, but matar is also rain. Uh, it's like having a single drop per se. Whereas geshem, it is a rainfall. Is the way you would translate those words there. But Elijah the Tishbite, he is the one. 
that they didn't do any of this. And it's kind of interesting too. He is a settler of Gilead. We're going to get into Bashan and Gilead a little bit later. And I think it's interesting that he's a settler of Gilead. You don't want to miss that because he knows what type of people were living in Gilead. And that were the giants, the Nephilim, the fallen ones, the Rahafim. They were the ones that were living in these areas right here. So he knows very well how to deal with them because that's who they're going to be dealing with in this day and age as well. And I think that's why God even brings it out. That who was of the settlers of Gilead. All right, who were the settlers of Gilead? The tribe of Manasseh. It was Manasseh that fought against them with Joshua and overcome those giants. And he was one of those settlers of that land at that time. He also knows how to deal with them, doesn't he? And that's another thing that Moses... And Elijah have in common. Moses dealt with the giants and Elijah dealt with the giants. Didn't know that, did you? All right. So let's look also at Isaiah 61. Now remember I did a message about this the other day because of the whole idea of the Revelation 12 sign that so many people have been looking forward to. And as I stated, you know, I did not believe that there would be a rapture at this time. Uh, you know, maybe there is some significance because God always declares in the heavens before something happens on earth. But when it comes down to it, is this the year of Jubilee? I have no evidence to support that. I know we could say uh, Rabbi Yudah ben Samuel because he did a prophecy uh, that this would happen. The, the Ottoman Empire would reign 400 years and then there would be a no man's land between the time of the top of the Ottoman Empire and 1917 and 1967 when Israel actually takes it as a nation. He called that the year of Jubilee. All right. If that were to be so, then all right, then maybe this would be a year of Jubilee if you go by the Gregorian calendar. But that's the point. I don't think necessarily that it is. All right. And so I didn't want people to get really all up into the hype of this. Uh, and I was trying to show what will happen though, when in true fact that it truly is a year of Jubilee. All right. It's not so much a catching up of a rapture, but it, when the true jubilee comes forth, it's when the people go free. It is when Israel, both the house of Judah and the house of Israel, wake up to who they are and they recognize that Yeshua indeed is the Mashiach and they get the true word of God, the restoration of his word. This is the true jubilee. And of course, for the house of Judah, is to recognize the one whom they've crucified, the one that they pierced, right? Notice Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to bring good tidings unto the humble. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of eyes to them that are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's good pleasure, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give to them unto them a garland of ashes, uh, the oil of joy for mourning, the mantle of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the terebinths of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, wherein He might glory. That they shall and and they shall build the old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall renew the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. There's a lot of information right here, friends. Of course, we know that Yeshua fulfilled that first verse and half of verse two, closes the scroll after the priest hands it to him and says, this day, this scripture is fulfilled within your hearing, right? He didn't go to the rest of verse two. Why? Because that jubilee had not come. And I can't help but believe that it was a jubilee when he spoke those words. But finding out exactly when that happened is very difficult to know for sure. All right. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Well, oddly enough, that time of mourning would actually fall exactly on a Yom Kippur, a day of atonement, as it's said in English, the day of mourning is a better way to translate the word Yom Kippur because that's exactly what it is. But oddly enough, I believe that a jubilee year would be the time when your two witnesses come, mainly because we find this very interesting uh, thing that happens 
uh, and let's look into this, Leviticus chapter 25, then shalt thou make proclamation with the blast of the horn on the tenth day of the seventh month and the day of atonement, shall you make a proclamation with the horn throughout all your land. And you shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land and all the inhabitants of the land. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man into his possession, and you shall return every man into his family. And a jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you, and you shall not sow, neither shall you uh, uh, reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it or, or uh, of the undressed vines. Why? This is what actually was happening with Isaiah 61. Yes, it is a year of jubilee. They return every man his own family. Like in Zechariah chapter 12 where you see that it's a family returning. It is Nathan, uh, uh, even uh, Shimei is of the Benjamites. It is Nathan and David who are of the house of Judah or the tribe of Judah and then the Levites. See, they come back by family names. They're returning as well as we're going to find that the house of Israel too comes home and they return. The families return on that 50th year of Jubilee. It's a binding together of the sticks there of what we read about in the, in the prophecies as well. The stick of, uh, of, of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, which is speaking of the house of Israel, and the stick of Judah. They're bound together. And that has a lot more to do with what you could even imagine what that has to do with. All right, but notice, see, you're not allowed to plant during that time, during that 50th Jubilee. And you're not allowed to even, you don't go in there and reap anything. See why? Because Yeshua was the one that did the planting. And it's the witnesses, his two prophets that do the reaping, the in gathering. This is why you don't do any of these things during this time. So I just think it's fascinating when we look over here at Leviticus chapter 25 and see how that jubilee plays into there. Now also Matthew 17. I really want to show you how we know who the two witnesses are by other scriptures as well. Now we can just, we see when they kind of maybe will, will bring about their prophecy uh, and that's a conjecture as far as Isaiah 61. You know, could it be on a year that's not a jubilee? Sure it could be because you still have, there's no reaping and harvesting, but I think it'll be a year of jubilee. I can't help but believe it's going to be a year of jubilee when that comes. But again, we don't know when jubilee is. That has been, they didn't, Israel has not celebrated that. The Israelite people since the house of Israel went into captivity. And this is one reason why we don't really know anymore. All right. So, and his disciples asked him, saying, Matthew 17, when, sh when they say this, uh, excuse me, uh, asked him, saying, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke of, unto them of John the Baptist. But did you notice how Yeshua used the verbiage in here? Now, unless, unless the Greek language has lost its meaning, the same as in English, because even in the Greek language, it does say, Elias truly shall, future tense, first come, and not only come, but he's going to restore all things. Believe me, John the Baptist was not the one coming to restore all things. It was Yeshua that was coming to restore all things when he came here 2,000 years ago. So then why then does Elias must, why does Elijah have to come to restore all things? Well, you know, when the spirit of Elijah was upon John the Baptist, he was there to see the ministry of Yeshua and the restoration of the Word of God. All right? So he knows what that restoration should be. And he also knows that because at Nicaea, Rome in 325, they have taken and twisted the Word of God and and all these different denominations, and maybe, I don't doubt that many people mean well. But you know, when God says in His Word, in Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people, unless you be partakers of her sins, you know, come out of her, my people, means to come out, something is wrong. And that's not just Israel, that can apply to both Israel and the Gentiles being involved in a false doctrine. But how many thousands of denominations are in Christianity? How many different, how many, how many hundreds of Orthodox 
orthodoxies or, or reform or different sects of Judaism do we have? And then yet people want to say that Judaism and the church or the goyim are the two witnesses. Are you serious? I mean, that would have to be vomit. I have to tell you like it is. You mean I can take a thousand different denominations and say that's a witness unto Christ. That is no witness to Christ. The same thing in Orthodox Judaism. Do you know how, how bitter they fight with one another over different doctrinal issues? Whether it be Reform, Orthodox, Acidic, Ultra Acidic, and all the different groups that are among the Orthodox community, all having bitter disputes over the interpretation of the Word of God. And that's supposed to be one of our witnesses to us. What are we supposed to do? Scratch our head and say, oh, I don't know. Do I go this way? Go that way? I don't know. And they don't agree with one another. And that's supposed to be two witnesses? Are you serious? Well, I'm sorry. Maybe it's the Sanhedrin in the Vatican. I mean, friends, come on, please. Wake up. Wake up. My Orthodox brethren, wake up and recognize who Mashiach really is. Okay? Now, so let's take a look at this. Elias truly shall first come, but then he answers the fact that he already come, and they did to him what was listed. He was showing you that Elias is going to come more than once. Now, let's take a look at another prophecy, and this is the one that's really going to get you. And we're going to come back to the Elijah prophecy still yet, all right? But I'm going to take a little turn here. Micah chapter 7. I've done this one with you before, but God showed me something new today when I was studying this part here. And this is where you find out who the witnesses will actually be dealing with. All right? Remember what I said about Elijah. He was the inhabitant of Gilead. He wasn't a Gileadite. He was an inhabitant. In other words, he had to have been from the tribe of Manasseh. Because Manasseh inhabited the land of Gilead after Joshua, they fought the giants that were living there, okay? Elijah comes from this land. So he knows all about the giants, right? Moses, before they ever crossed over with Joshua, when they were coming up as well, Moses already knew. Joshua and the spies, they brought back the report about the giants in the land. Moses knows all about the giants as well, okay? Not to mention Noph and Taphanes down in Egypt who were eating away the crown of their head, destroying the brain. They were princes of Egypt. And Nop, according to the Arab, Arabic tradition, is the Nephilim. You don't think Moses doesn't know about these giants? Sure he does. Sure he does. All right? So what does it say here? Micah chapter 7, after the war that Israel, all the fighting that's going on around the land of Israel there in that whole region, as it prophesies in Micah chapter 7, you get down to verse 13, 14. Tend thy people with thy staff. Literally, feed thy people with the rod of thy staff, the flock of thy heritage that dwell solitarily as a forest in the midst of a fruitful field. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. You know what that feeding was all about? Faith. Faith. Feed, but he's telling them to feed with the rod of thy staff. Bring it back to their memory. That rod of that staff there is a DNA. It is what's in their DNA that they know, that they remember. When you're born on this earth, just like for example, when you're born, you get traits, your mother, your father, whatever, makes you look like that. I look like my father. I have a little bit of looks of my mother, but I definitely look like my dad. 100% look like him. He couldn't deny me if he wanted to. All right? But that's not the only issue, guys. Let me tell you something. Besides your look, you get memories that come down through there as well. You may not realize it, but you do. You know, our daughter has suffered major dyslexia. We've had all kinds of, tried to have experts and everything work with her. And you know, the thing that came to my heart the other day was the books that I read when I was a little child, because I had dyslexia as well. And when I was a child, I read the C-Spot run, book, and it came on my heart, and oddly enough, they actually had it at Barnes & Noble. I picked it up, brought it home. My daughter opened it and began to read it like it was nothing. It's in her DNA. When a heart transplant is given to another patient, like in the case of one little girl, I think she was eight years old, she got the heart of a nine-year-old girl that had been murdered. Within two weeks or so, she began to get the memories of the little girl. And what was it? She saw the killer, who it was, what the little girl said right before she died, identified the attacker, and the man was put in prison and, and convicted on the testimony of the girl that, was, that actually was a recipient of the heart. 
There's documented and documented and documented cases of people getting the DNA, memories or habits of those people, of the donors. How much more of that that's, hit, that's inside of you passed on down? The memories of our ancestors that were there when Yeshua walked the earth and spoke to the, to the apostles and to the 70 and to the multitudes. And you are their children. It's in you too. So Moses, or in this case, I think it's Moses, and the reason why I say that, because he refers to, uh, as in the days of thy coming forth out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. That's Moses. And he's going to show, and actually the word marvelous is the wrong translation, okay? Nephilot. Nephilot, right here. Nephilot. That is wonders. I will show him and this little, this little letter right there is where you get the word him there. I will show him. He's going, he, in other words, he's going to see wonders. But he's going to feed them with what? The rod. See, ro'e'amcha. See, feed or tend or lead your people. Beshebetecha. With the rod of your heritage. It's a DNA. It's a genetic thing. But what is he going to deal with? He is going to deal with also though. All right? that they dwell as solitary as in the forest in the midst of the fruitful field. Now we're going to come back to Micah in just a moment. But let's take a look at though at this whole idea of Bashan and Gilead so you know what I'm talking about. Deuteronomy chapter 3. For uh, chapter 3 verse 11 for only Og king of Bashan remained of the remnant of the Rephaim giants as well. Behold his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not uh, Reba of the children of Ammon, nine cubits was the length thereof, four cubits the breadth thereof, and the cubit of a man. And this land we took in possession at that time from Aurora, which is by the valley of Armon, and half of the hill country of Gilead, and the cities thereof gave I unto the Reubenites and the Gadites. And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half tribe of Manasseh and the region of Orgab, all that Bashan is called the land of Rephaim. All right, so now there does give us a possibility then that Elijah could have been a he could have been from the tribe of Reuben as well, or the tribe of Gad, seeing as they were also in that area of that land. So we have three possibilities: Reuben, Gad, or Manasseh. Nonetheless, he is from those that reside there that know what it's like to deal with the giants, just like Moses, okay? And don't forget, I bring this up, why? Because what did Yeshua say? Matthew 24, verse 36 to 39, but of that day and hour no man, uh, excuse me, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, but as the days of Noah were, so also shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, for as in the days that, uh, that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And as I brought out about that particular issue there, as I have clearly made it known, before the days of Noah, if you go to Enoch chapter 7, and Noah, and I understand that we have the record in there of the giants being, my gosh, no telling how tall, you know, I question whether or not that was ever translated right or if it was transcribed by accident. They put the wrong number in there, the, the scribe. Remember, scribes are not prophets, okay? They're only scribes, and they could have made that m mistake along the way there. But the point is, is Enoch was part of the biblical canon at the at, at Qumran community. All right, so when we're looking at these giants that are, you know, we see clearly Yeshua saying, as it was in the days of Noah, the ones that ate the flesh and drank the blood were the Nephilim. Okay? They were, it was the Nephilim that were doing that. And it was also their fathers, the fallen angels, that took and had sex with women and bore giants by them. Forced marriage. The given in marriage in the Greek language is a forced marriage. Now, I'm going to prove to you, though, that these witnesses are dealing with that very issue there. Let's look at Micah chapter 7, move a little further down. The nation shall see, all right? The nation shall see and be put to shame for all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like crawling things of the earth. They shall come trembling out of their closed places. They shall come with fear unto the Lord our God and shall be afraid because of you. Hmm. 
Now, a couple of things you need to see about this. They will be afraid because of you, all right? Mimecha. That's one guy. And obviously, it's Moses because it's, he says, like it was when you came out of Egypt. So it all seems to be a, a scripture that is applying to Moses. But notice this, the nation shall see and be put to shame for all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. Why? They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like crawling things out of the earth. Shall they come trembling out of their close places. Is that possibility? Are we looking at these Nephilim once again. You know how they talk about these, like they said in Afghanistan, these giants were in the earth? Well, you know, literally in Hebrew right here, it's talking about they come out like a worm, like a snake out of the ground. I have no idea. It's a conjecture, I have to say. I don't know for sure. But it's very, very concerning to me. Okay, so Exodus chapter 15. More proof in scriptures here to show you who your two witnesses are. This is a prophecy that's still unfulfilled about Moses. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. All right. Now, in Hebrew, it's very obvious. Az yashir Moshe uvane Yisrael et hashira hazot Ladonai, as normally the Jews would say, Then he says here, Ashira, it's in the future. I will sing. That he will toss the horse and his rider into the sea. Remember the horse rider of Revelation. It's the same demonic being on each one of the horses, only a different color horse representing the evils that they would do. Now also we have the prophecy of Exodus chapter 34. Again, a prophecy where Moses has never fulfilled the prophecy as of yet. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels. The word marvels is incorrect. In Hebrew to the year left, it's nifolot. It's wonders. I will do wonders such as have not been wrought in all the earth, nor in any nation. All the people among which you art shall see the work of the Lord that I am about to do with you. That is tremendous. Observe that which I am commanding thee this day. Behold, I am driving out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitant of the land, whether thou goest, lest they be for a snare in the midst of thee. All right, this is something you got to understand. Now, Moses smote the rock the second time. All right? And God had already told him, you're not going into the promised land. Now, God doesn't make mistakes. God can't be prophesying that Moses is going to the promised land and going to do wonders like has never been done on the earth unless it's a future date. Because he'd already told Moses, you're not going in, right? You're not going in. And he's not talking about someone else I mean, take heed to thyself. He shamaya lecha. Lecha, that's yourself, not somebody else. That's Moses. Take heed to yourself. All right? Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. All right? And then people look at me and they say, Ah, oh, Steve, you're against Israel. All right? Now, I'm not even a witness by no means, but my point is, is, you know, I want to think the way that this man would think as well when he comes. He's, not, he's been warned not to make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. Don't make a covenant. You know, they shouldn't be making a covenant with Rome because the inhabitants of the land is Rome. Rome is the one that brought in uh, Ben-Gurion. Rome brought in Moshe Sharit, the second prime minister of Israel. And Rome has been controlling Israel with many, not all of the prime ministers were ever under Rome's control. Menachem Begin was one that definitely was not under their control as we brought out how that happened. Remember, and for those of you, maybe it's your first time watching everything, let me let you know. Ben-Gurion, Moshe Sharit, these men here had ordered to kill all the, the Jews that were coming over on the, on the ship that was coming in, the Atalina, that was going to help to take Jerusalem. You know why they ordered their deaths? They had enough equipment, enough of everything. Look up Avi Lipkin. Avi Lipkin speaks about this 
on, on, in fact, he spoke at the conference where I first met Avi Lipkin in, in Jerusalem in 2015, I believe it was. They were ordering the Jews to kill the other Jews because they didn't want them going and trying to take Jerusalem because the Pope, it was promised to the Pope of Rome. In 1947, Pope Pius XII, who's so wonderful according to some of these false teachers of today that is rewriting history and covering up his sins. Not saying there weren't some good Catholic people that rescued the Jews. I realize that was true, but it didn't Pope Pius XII. All right? And that man was calling for the Resolution 181, that, that Jerusalem be an international city headed by the United Nations. And of course, as we find out from Joel Bainerman and the late Barry Chamish, that the Vatican would get full autonomy over the city, of course, with the UN military at their aid, right? <sighs> Makes me sick, friends. It really does. So when we see that Moses is to drive these people out, and they're going to drive them out, and he's told, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do, not marvels, even the rabbis admit marvels is the wrong word. You know why the rabbis say that they changed it to marvels instead of nipolot, wonders? They said, this is their argument. Well, Moses came out, he parted the Red Sea, he did all the plagues in Egypt, and he never did anything any greater. So it couldn't be wonders, it'd have to be marvels. <sighs> Moses didn't conquer the uh, he didn't conquer the Canaanite, Hittite, and Perizzite either, did he? We know Joshua did, but Joshua didn't get them all either because David had to do part of it. Right? Remember that? And according to Micah, we got these ones that are crawling out of the earth like serpents. Friends, I think something's coming up, and I don't think Moses ever fulfilled this prophecy. Let's move on. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi 4, for those of you that are reading the King James Version. And by the way, there again, it goes for the part about, as the Lord said to me, man hears more often than he listens. The other day I said, you know, if you have a King James Version or NIV and, and somebody makes a comment about the NIV, I don't, I don't care which translation you read. My point is, is anything outside of the Tanakh, the sequence of numbering of chapter and verses and stuff sometimes are a little different than what I'm reading if I'm using a Tanakh. So I tried to put it in here for you this time here. Uh, Malachi 3 in the Tanakh, Malachi 4 uh, uh, verses 2 through 6 in a King James Version Bible. All right. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing. In not its wings, his wings is the correct translation. And you shall go forth and um, gamble as calves of the saw. Grow, I think, in the King James. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I make, and in, in the day, in, in, excuse me, in the day that I do make, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, even statutes and ordinances. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with an utter destruction. Now, you have to really pay attention to some of the things that are worded right here. First thing I want to show with, share with you, and this was a revelation my wife got long ago, a beautiful revelation, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in His wings. Remember the woman at the well? Or no, no, I'm sorry, not the woman at the well, the woman with the blood issue? She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. Do you know the hem of the garment is where we find the tzitzit, and in Hebrew, we are commanded to put the tzitzit on the kanaf of our garment. That literally in Hebrew means the wing of our garment. So when it says, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, that little woman that had the blood issue, she knew that if she only touched his, the hem of his garment, the tzitzit of his wing that was on his garment, she would be made well. And there the prophecy was sitting right there. And you shall go forth and grow, uh, grow up as calves in the stalls. Really, this should be the right word there. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the sole of your feet in the day that I do make that I do make, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, again, who are the wicked right here? The Rashaim. 
I think it has a lot to do with the Nephilim. You're going to tread them down. There'll be ashes under the soles of your feet. That judgment is coming for them. Okay? Remember you the law of Moses, my servant. Now see here, Moses, one of the two witnesses, gets brought up. Remember him, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, even the statutes and the ordinances. That was, by the way, ten commandments and two statutes is what he spoke about. Right? And according to the, to the, to the scripture there in Deuteronomy, and he added no more. The extra laws that we get are, are, are just for the everyday living. But those were the ones that God wanted you to keep. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, here's what's interesting. It's actually them coming together. Moses and Elijah. All right? And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the, or the land with utter destruction or with a curse. Okay, now here's the interesting thing. In Luke chapter 1, Yeshua applies part of this to, to John. And many of the little children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias or Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the, uh, of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am old and, and my wife well stricken in years. What is this speaking about? Zechariah, he, you know, he, him and his wife is having the baby, which is John the Baptist, the cousin of Yeshua. And what do we find out? He is going to be the one that will forerun the Messiah, Messiah and he turns the hearts of the fathers to the children. What is the heart of the fathers? The fathers long for the coming of the Mashiach. So when it says he'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children is the children of Israel. Or in this case here, the house of Judah, because at this point it's the house of Judah. But it's also that it's to, to, all, to all Israel because Yeshua commands his apostles to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel as well. So all 12 tribes got to hear this message. But the house of Judah he went to first, okay? But he only turns the heart of the fathers to the children. In other words, the desire of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, especially Abraham. Why? Because Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He never could find it, friends. He wandered all through this land. He went down to Egypt. Remember, God giving the land all the way to the Nile, all the way back over to the Euphrates. And Abraham wandered that entire region of the earth. He said, I am a pilgrim and a stranger. I am looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Why? He met Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the king of peace. He was the high priest as well. And he knew if he was a king, he had to have a domain. He had to have a people. He had to have a city. But he couldn't find it. Why? It's not in this dimension. So when we say we are returning to the homeland, the homeland that's not, is not necessarily the physical land of Israel. It is to wake up to who we are so we can leave this dimension and be with our Lord forevermore. Didn't Yeshua say, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also? Alright? Keep these things in mind. So, he turns the heart of the children, of the, fa or the fathers to the children, but not the other way around. See, the Elijah of Malachi, there's two comings of that Elijah. The second one is when he turns the heart of the children to their fathers. That children is the children of Israel to the desire that the fathers had, which was the coming of the Messiah. First it was the fathers to the children. Now it's the other way around. In other words, this time when Elijah comes, he will cause the children of Israel, both houses, to recognize who Messiah is. What did Jesus say? Truly Elias must first come and restore all things. The only one that can cause that restoration is Elijah. And he's the one that will turn the children back to the fathers. Amazing, amazing, amazing. All right, let's look here. Revelation. Moving on down now. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Remember, they're to be killed, as we saw a little bit earlier there in verse 9. And they're going to make merry and send gifts one to another because these, what? Two prophets. Okay, I told you it was two prophets, right? 
I said, how can, two, how can you have Jew and Gentile be two prophets? No, it doesn't work like that, friends. It's two men anointed with their spirit. It literally could be them. I don't know. Tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory unto the God of heaven. Now, I have to tell you something, friends, the, the beautiful part about this here. One of the reasons why they actually die is because the Jews never believed that Yeshua resurrected. He was put into a tomb, they sealed it, and then, of course, a lie was told that his body was stolen away and he went off, died somewhere naturally. This is why this time God has them lay their dead bodies in the street and will not suffer them to be put in graves. It's to be a witness to the world that the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua was indeed true. And the reason why it's called Sodom and Egypt, I said I'd get to that later, is because the government of Israel is allowing sodomy, the very way Sodom was, they're allowing, allowing homosexuality to flourish in Israel under the ideology that we are a free and open society. And then people expect me to stand unconditionally with Israel and everything that the government does must be of God because after all, God is with them. Do you think God really supports that type of lifestyle? Do you think God is really for the gay parades in Jerusalem, that this is what sets an example for the God of Israel to have the government to do this? No. No wonder why God said to Moses, don't make any covenants with them when you come. Now, Ezekiel chapter 35, in verse 14, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoices, I will make thee desolate. Now, if you notice... It says here in Revelation that and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. We know by Ezekiel's prophecy when this is actually going to happen. And say, uh, and say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the old Mount Seir, which is Esau's children. I will stretch out my hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Because thou hast had a hatred of old, and hast hurled the children of Israel into the power of the sword, in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity, excuse me, in the time of the iniquity of the end. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee into blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Surely thou hast hated thine own blood, because Esau is a remnant. He's also a, a, a son of Abraham. Therefore, blood shall pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Seir desolate, and cut off from it him that passeth through, and him that returneth. Obadiah. Chapter 1, only one chapter. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Again, the word calamity, just like what we saw when we were looking at Ezekiel chapter 35. Remember, they were hurled to the power of the sword. The Romans were definitely using a sword, no doubt about it. Uh, during the time when Titus, the Roman general, came down and did exactly that. Daniel deals in chapter 9, verse 24, with the time their iniquity would have an end. Seventy weeks are de decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to forgive iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophet to anoint the most holy place. That's in the day you're living in now. So all these prophecies are actually happening right before our eyes. So when we look here, Revelation 11, in closing here, all right, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, right, and make merry and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the Spirit of, from God entered into them, 
that they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain of men, seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. You know, one thing I want you guys to remember as well, friends, that when we are looking, we always see this word remnant. Even when you guys were reading this, the, the prophecy of Revelation 12, do you realize that that speaks about the remnant? That, that Satan was wroth, that dragon was wroth with the remnant of the woman's seed. That's the children of Israel. That's both houses. House of Judah, house of Israel. He's wroth with the remnant of the woman's seed. And he went after her. There's only a remnant. Even in Israel today, all the people that are there in Israel today, there's many. There's no doubt many of the house of Judah that are there. But not everybody that is there is truly of the remnant of Israel. And this is what you have to understand. Like Menachem Begin and the group there that were willing to fight for the whole land. That was more the true spirit of the Jewish people wanting to return home. The true spirit is when they come and they buy the land, like we saw back in the mid-1800s. But there's a totally different thing that's happening in Israel today. And the only way I can see that it will resolve this issue is the coming of the two witnesses. And I believe that we're right at the door of that. I'm Stephen Benoon. I realize this has been lengthy. But friends, we've got to set the record straight. And I'm not here to play church. I'm not here to play games. I'm here to tell you what's true. We'll continue to do the news. But we will also start bringing some strong, powerful teachings. Some of them will be just a tremendous blessing to hear. Other ones will be corrective. Because we've got to lay in. and We've got to truly set things straight. We love you. We thank you. And thank you for your your kindness and your support of the work that we do. I'm Stephen Benin with Israeli News Live, the Noon Institute of Biblical Research.